Hello, everyone, and welcome to this final session of the Strand Feminism and its Discontents. And I think it's been a really wonderful and interesting weekend, and especially this Strand has really brought up some very thought-provoking ideas. So I'm very glad that we are holding our session, Campus Wars, Safe or Sanitised? And in the last two years, there has been a surge in censorious actions on university campuses with songs, jokes, clothing, pamphlets, and people all being banned in the name of protecting students from offence. And last year, when I was at the Battle of Ideas, I debated whether or not free speech was at risk on campus. But I think by now, it's become clear that it is. And we may disagree on to what extent, but there is definitely a problem with free speech on campus and in universities today. You may have thought that educational institutions should uphold and protect the freedom to say and think whatever their students like, but this is not the case. And there has been a recent small backlash against attacks on free speech, with most notably President Obama telling a group of students, I don't agree that when you become students at college, you have to be coddled and protected from different points of view. Unfortunately, his ideas of freedom don't expand much further than that in terms of freedom of speech. And we still haven't gotten to the bottom of when and why free speech became unfashionable on university campuses and outside of the walls of university, or whether this banning and boycotting trend is actually contained within campuses or whether it's spread. So can we really argue that creating safe spaces by compacting and controlling people's speech in order to let vulnerable people speak more, is that really a viable option? And where do we go from here, most importantly? How do we address the censorious trend on campus? And I've got a really brilliant panel, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they will speak. They will give five minutes, and then I'm going to take it as quickly as I can out to the audience, because I think in the spirit of the Battle of Ideas, we should have as much discussion about this as we can. So I'm going to start with Tom Slater. Tom is the deputy editor at Spikes and coordinator of Spikes Free Speech University Rankings, which is now preparing for its second year, and its launch is going to be in February 2016. Tom has been touring campuses across the UK with our Down With Campus Censorship campaign, holding debates about free speech, and he has had some first-hand experience of the situation of free speech on campus. Next to speak will be Gia Milinovic, TV presenter and producer. And Gia is also on the board of trustees for Conway Hall, where she puts on many really fantastic and interesting debates, including a recent rather controversial one, which discussed free speech with the recently charged student union officer, Baha Mustafa. Gia calls herself a skeptic and a feminist, but not the Tumblr kind. <laughs> Next to speak will be Christina Hoff Summers an author and resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. But more importantly, the reason why I invited Christine to speak is that she hosts a really brilliant video blog, The Factual Feminist, which pulls apart and questions the censorious nature of contemporary feminism and looks at the situation of censorship on campus. And last but not least, I have Ian Dunn. Ian is the editor of politics.co.uk and is the political editor of The Erotic Review. He writes frequently on free speech and has really interesting and robust ideas on it, recently covering the banning of Miriam Namazi from Warwick University. So without further ado, Tom, take us off. Thanks a lot, Ellen. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So for those of us who write and campaign on this issue, Freshers' Week is always a particularly decisive time. You've got the student unions kind of come back with a little bit of a vengeance. You've got all these fresh-faced young students who are kind of blissfully unversed in all of the codes and regulations that they're walking into. And you always get this flurry of bans, um, which gives you a little bit of a sense of what the, what the year is going to hold. This Freshers' Week, I'm sure we can all agree, was certainly no exception to that. We had at the University of Warwick, of course, as has already been mentioned. Um, the Students' Union attempt to ban um, Mariam Namazi, an ex-Muslim and a secularist campaigner. And this was on the basis that they felt she was highly inflammatory and could incite hatred towards Muslim students. Um, I think it was the week afterwards, you had the University of Manchester um, banning feminist Julie Bindle from speaking on the basis that her transphobic views, again, would make people feel unsafe. Um, a few weeks later, a slightly more comical example was the University of East Anglia banning um, sombreros or a Tex-Mex restaurant from handing out sombreros. They even incidentally went around chasing students who had managed to get their hands on one so they could <laughs> confiscate them. Again, because they felt it was promoting racial stereotypes. And to top it all off, um, the Oxford University Students' Union stopped um, a group of students handing out a magazine that they'd made, a free speech magazine called No Offence, because they were concerned it might cause 
offence. Um, so having seen all of that, us at, at Spiked and Downward Campus Censorship, we were really getting ready for another kind of mental year of it. But something was very different this time around. As Ella's already alluded to, there was this backlash, and particularly in the UK, you had this kickback from columnists, from commentators, activists. Everyone was saying in every newspaper you can imagine across the political spectrum that these students were liberal and censorious and something had to be done about it. In fact, the outcry was so intense that um, Mariam Namazi um, was actually allowed to speak at Warwick in the end. They reversed the decision. And for a moment you think, brilliant, we're reaching a bit of a tipping point after a long time of being told that this wasn't an issue, that perhaps we were taking it too far, that we were free speech extremists. Everyone seemed to recognise that if you have students that are so censorious, um, and particularly at a university which really should uphold the values of free speech and open debate, almost more so than anywhere else, then that's definitely a problem for politics and for public life more broadly. Um, but what I want to put across today is that I think that backlash not only wasn't enough, I think it was deeply hypocritical. And if we really want to challenge these things, we need to um, really look properly at what this contains. Because many secularists on you who are really fuming about the Namazi ban um, and saying, how, how can they say that they're inciting racial hatred? Their, their main gripe a lot of the time seemed to be that this was inaccurate. You know, it's those Islamists who incite the hatred. Um, similarly, many feminists took to Twitter and um, wrote open letters, you know, opposing the NUS's no platform for Julie Bindle, as well as um, campaigning against or pulling out of um, the Feminism in London conference, I think it was, when, when Jane Fay, another feminist speaker, was told she couldn't attend. Um, but scratched beneath the surface, and the underlying logic seemed to be, no platform was fine when it was just for fascists. Why is it being used against feminists? And rather than making the case for free speech for all, it seemed that people were just making the case for individuals, why this person should, shouldn't have been banned rather than this person. Um, it was partisan, I think, rather than principled. And saying free speech for me and my mates is not really going to be the rallying cry of any free speech fight back worth having. If anything, I think it's going to make it worse. And the reason I think it's going to make it worse is because it really still ignores the fundamental um, meaning and kind of lesson of freedom of speech. First of all is that it's, and by its very nature, it has to be indivisible. The, the moment you try and qualify it or caveat it, you kind of arm and ar about it, you um, kind of worry it into non-existence, it does start to crumble. And secondly, the kind of practical application of that is that as soon as, not only if you actively justify someone else's censorship, but if you just essentially let it happen, if you say it's not my issue, you ignore it, it will come back to bite you. I mean, it's as Thomas Paine wrote, he that would make his own liberty secure must guard even his enemy from oppression, for if he violates this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach unto itself. This is really an age-old lesson, and even within this very partisan fight back, it's something that we're missing. What's more, I think we're in danger here of effectively people refusing to face up to the role that they themselves might have played in creating this censorious climate. There is a tendency to see these liberal students as a bit of an aberration. They're kind of like a generational blip or like a science experiment gone wrong. There's never really um, anyone who's willing to face up to the fact that this is a broad problem that many of them indeed have contributed to. And I think you see this particularly with feminists and conservatives. So feminists throughout the 1970s and 80s and campaigned again, for banning pornography um, to, to everyday sexism today, which campaigns against catcalling, that has done so much to fuel the idea that words wound and that people be, f should be protected from it. And then the other side, you've got conservative students, many of which I talk to, who think the idea that all this feminist censoriousness is rubbish, the idea that a lad's mag or a laddish comedian could fuel a culture of misogyny, you know, they get really het up about it and they start making comparisons to North Korea. Yet, they also buy into this idea. They buy into the idea that the way to solve Islamic extremism is to protect easily led Muslims from hearing Islamic speakers. They even endorse, many of them, the government's plans to censor not only people who advocate terrorism on campus, but people who advocate views a bit like terrorists. Um, intolerant ideas, as Cameron put it in his um, speech in July, create a climate in which extremists can flourish. And to me, this is, is exactly the same argument. The feminists have lad culture, the campus conservatives have jihad culture. It's effectively the same thing. And just to sum up, the point I want to make is that these liberal students are not aberrations. I think they're merely responding to a climate that is shared really across the campus political spectrum that sees unfettered free speech as dangerous and students as very vulnerable to its influence. So I think that's why now, more than ever, we need to go back 
to the fundamentals. Um, more than ever, we need to make a strident case for free speech for all with no ifs and no buts. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're willing to make those concessions, if you're willing to turn a blind eye even when someone else is censored, if you're willing, in effect, to say free speech for me but not for thee, then you're part of the problem, not the solution. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> All right, Gia. So for my little statement, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how I got involved in this topic, because unlike the other panelists, I'm not a journalist or an academic. I'm kind of a normal person who's found herself <laughs> in the middle of a kind of madness. Um, I'm an atheist and a skeptic, and I approach feminism from that background. Um, three years ago, friends of mine uh, started to be attacked by trans activists on social media. Two of my friends are comedians. Uh, one is a journalist, and all three used words that, unbeknownst to them, trans activists now consider to be off limits. These are words that you cannot say. After my third friend was attacked, I thought, okay, this is a trend. Um, I want to look into this. And so I set up a discussion with skeptics in the pub. I booked it nine months in advance, and I spent nine months reading up on all of this, literally kind of doing nothing else other than reading about this. So I read up on the radical feminist position. Um, and I think radical feminism is probably, when most people hear the word feminism, it's what they think of. It's, it, it came from political activism in the 70s and 80s. I read up on the trans activist position, and I read up on the liberal feminist, or what I call the Tumblr feminist position. If you don't know, Tumblr is a website where you can host your own blog, and it's kind of ground zero for the bullshit that you're <laughs> going to hear about. Student politics, politics is basically run by people who follow the liberal feminist and trans activist ideologies. Um, trans activists and liberal feminists are aligned together against radical feminists, and I don't want to go too much into this, but the main fault line is the definition between sex and gender. Radical feminists think that biological sex is a real thing, so there are female people who can get pregnant, there are male people who can impregnate female people. <laughs> it's really, really radical. Um, trans activists and liberal feminists think that biological sex is a state of mind or a feeling. Um, on this particular subject, I agree with radical feminists and stating so publicly made me an evil person. Mm -hmm. So the main thing that struck me very early on when I was reading about this is that the liberal feminist and um, trans activist positions are based almost entirely on feelings. So I, I feel this, therefore it's true. Not I feel this, therefore it's true for me. I feel this, therefore it is true for everyone. And it's very similar to when someone says, I believe in God, I, I feel that God is real, therefore God is true. This means that there is a doctrine there is one way that you can feel about something and still be part of the group. And being in the group is good. If you're not part of the group, you are bad or you are evil. There are shibboleths, so words that tell someone whether you are in group or whether you are out group. If you use the wrong words, you are out group and you are impure and you are evil. There is a hierarchy of oppression and privilege. So oppressed people are in group. Anyone who is out of the group is an oppressor. It's better to be oppressed and in group. So one has to announce their oppressions and admit to their privileges or confess. They have to do this before they're listened to because only people in the group can be listened to. Overall, there's the idea that I believe, therefore I am. I believe in this doctorate, doctrine, so this is my identity. The, the, what I believe makes me exist, it makes me real. The converse of that, of course, is that if you don't believe, you logically shouldn't exist. You're a non-person and you're a heretic. So it's okay to tell heretics that they should be set on fire, that they should have their throats slit, that they should have their heads stomped on, because they, <laughs> they shouldn't exist. All of those things have been told to me by um, trans activists or liberal feminists. 
So anyone who may have been involved in skepticism might be recognizing the hallmarks of ideological totalism or cult psychology. So there's the control of communication, the demand for purity, the cult of confession, thought terminating cliches, doctrine over person, dispensing of existence. So my feeling is that liberal feminism and trans activism are a form of ideological totalism and they need to be very seriously challenged. Ideological totalist environments are very attractive to young people. So we see this with religious extremism, we see it with self-help cults like Landmark Forum, um, young people are the people going into things like Scientology. Universities have a duty of care to our young people and they need to step in, they need to be the adults and they need to enforce a secular intellectual space on campus. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. I'm Christina Hoff Summers, and I've been lecturing on campuses for many years to debate feminism. I'm a, an equity feminist, an old fashioned classical egalitarian. I believe in the radical notion that men and women are equal, <laughs> not necessarily the same. Uh, however, this created conflict, and I would go to campuses, and for many years, I mean, either sometimes the women's studies or let's say the gender activists, they would not attend, or they would, they'd come to spar and debate, that was fine. This all changed about two years ago, but especially last year, I went to Georgetown, I went to UCLA, I went to Yale, I went to Oberlin. It became worse and worse from campus to campus, Oberlin being the most surprising. I arrive on campus and already, there had been frantic Facebook postings that this dangerous person was coming to campus and stipulate a liberal feminist. You know, that, I mean, that, that I had never been treated as a pariah quite like that. I mean, occasionally, but not like that. And uh, in fact, the Facebook postings were so ferocious, so unhinged, that the, the college uh, uh, administrators determined that I, these girls were talking about their safe space, and she's, we, we don't feel safe. The college administrators determined that I might not be safe, and they gave me an, an armed guard. I had to have an armed guard at this precious liberal arts campus in, in rural Ohio. It was absurd. I didn't ask for the guard, and I did not feel frightened, but there, there were two guards, and the guards were nervous about the whole thing. I go into the room, it's packed because they make, I mean, they, again, they make the mistake of making such a fuss, everyone becomes interested. Let's see this, what this uh, crank has to say, this dangerous person. And um, th the first two rows, they were young women with their mouths taped shut. About, I don't know, 20 or 30 young women protesting me in this way, which wasn't meaningful to me. I didn't know what it meant. Red duct tape. I mean, maybe I was silencing them, but I'd come to debate. I don't understand, but that's what they were doing. And then the other students uh, were holding signs, and every time I'd say, no matter what I said, there were uh, groans, and oh, and, and then I told them, um, uh, so one of them would say something, and they'd all clap, and I, I told them that clapping was triggering, because I'd learned that from, the, from, the, from Great Britain, where they'd had a conference of feminist leaders, and they were urged to use jazz hands rather than clapping, which apparently causes distress and fainting spells or something. And you know, when I said that, they, they actually started using Jazz hands. I mean, they thought I was serious anyway. Uh, they created a safe space. And at one uh, point, I found, uh, this was in the campus newspaper, that 30 students and a dog, a therapy dog, they'd fled to this safe space that I'd somehow triggered a dog. <laughs> and I felt bad about that. But uh, now, how did this happen? What happened to these young women? And I, I do find it cult-like, uh, especially at Oberlin. I felt I was meeting people who had been initiated into a very strange religion. And I was the uh, apostate, not apostate, but I was the, I was the devil <laughs> of that religion. Uh, now, I think uh, what happens on our campus is you have only one minute. Oh my God, I, okay. You have these very uh, um, sensitive young women and they come in the first year. 
They're initiated into this uh, world where they learn about trigger warnings and othering and microaggression, male privilege, safe space. This paranoid worldview is buttressed by conspiracy theories about the patriarchy, twisted theories that have no basis. Philosophers, they're not taught in sane philosophy departments, but they're taught in these gender theory classes. And then they have these statistics. I mean, these young women learn that they will, you know, that they're bombarded with this sort of victim catechism that one in four women or one in, th one in four, one in five will be raped, two to three women battered. Women then, you know, you'll be cheated out of 25% of your salary. That's if you're all not already dead from an eating disorder. <laughs> and these are lovely, idealistic girls, but they're 18, 19, they're very sensitive. They're at Oberlin, they're at Swarthmore, they're at Yale, and they want to do right by the world. And I don't think this affects all young women, but a small percentage are tempted. And they're so ferocious there now, and I'm going to close with this. They're using now the language of the Holocaust. They talk about themselves being survivors, and they call me a, a rape denier, a rape, a rape crisis denier or something. Uh, 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 and, and the, they consider you a very bad person because you're denying, you're invalidating their experience. That's the, 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 uh, the crime against there can be no worse. So they are now a force of unreason and censorship. And we're talking about, you know, uh, is the campus dangerous? It's a dangerous place for, for freedom. It's a dangerous place for free expression. And I think it's a dangerous place for the minds of young women. We're seeing the closing of so many minds. So I do think that the campus is, is unsafe because it has been sanitized. And um, we have to find a way to create a rebellion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. OK, Ian. We definitely have a crisis of free speech, and it seems incredibly severe. I mean, occasionally I talk to academics from the 70s and the 80s, and they're like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. It was just as bad in my day, and, you know, if you said something against, you know, feminism, they would clap you until you couldn't speak anymore, and all of this sort of stuff. It does seem more pernicious now, and I would put it down to um, a combination of two factors. First one is um, the left's relinquishment of any economic debate, of just handing the economic debate to the right and focusing instead on these issues of identity, and that coming at a time where social media allowed us to just retreat into these ghettoized tribes, where we had even less contact with our opponents and where we could create echo chambers. The result of that has been this sort of consumerism of politics, where your politics says more about who you are than it does about the world and how you want to change it. The results have been quite severe. I mean, when you try to talk to these guys online, when they come at you, there's that almost no content to the argument at all. You're told over and over, you must listen to these voices, these excluded voices. But when you ask what they're saying, they constantly come up with just a, oh, I can't even. I mean, I can't even describe. And it's just it's this resistance to actually engaging in any of the debate. The intellectual ghettos have been um, created. And more importantly, the right is just set free. I mean, for anyone who's, who's sort of a left-winger, it's an absolute disaster to just see the right just do whatever the hell it wants because the left is just in a pit cutting itself over and over again over the use of language. Um, and ultimately, at the end of this trend, I mean, now when you actually see quite young journalists coming out, sort of journalists when they're 22, 23, they've mostly internalized a lot of these arguments, actually. And will very often, I mean, they'll write a piece. And then as soon as someone, you know, comes who, who might be, you know, say they're from Iran or something, and they say, well, actually, you know, as someone of color, right, I think that there's a problem here. They, they'll just go in and they'll say, well, now I'm going to change the words that I've used because, you know, they, they clearly have pointed out my privilege and I have to change it. So actually, there's almost no sense that there is an objective truth in many of the young journalists that I see coming out, and that we are just these bundles of our own sort of you know, prejudices and discriminations and our own sort of immaterial circumstances. So the threat is very, very real. And I think um, Tom sort of correctly pointed out that there's a change now, there's an opportunity now for the debate to be turned. There's an understanding in society that something dangerous has happened. And there's an understanding within identity politics that something dangerous has happened. And this is where I think the opportunity is. We can say to ourselves, we are going to implement purity politics as libertarians, as people that believe in free speech, and just go, we will only work with those who absolutely satisfy all of our conditions. And I'm afraid that we will find very, very few people to work with within feminism, within the anti-racist movement, within the trans movement, very, very few. Because most of the people, when you talk to them, actually, they're like, well, actually, I do believe in some safe spaces and all of that. So 
we'll find almost no one to work with, or we can say that they have recognised the fact that free speech is ultimately a matter of self-interest. And once you can get that argument across, you can be part of the negotiations, part of the discussion that happens in a wider community than just the people that advocate for free speech, than just libertarians. Part of this, I think, is when we talk about the value of free speech, we don't just talk about adversarial politics. We talk about engagement and about the fact that our ideas develop more because they come into contact with other people's ideas. We have an opportunity now to do something different. And I sense and I worry that libertarians, overwhelmingly, and free speech advocates are much more interested in the adversarial nature of things and taking on identity politics in pointing out the little things that someone may have done that we don't quite agree with, isn't a full commitment to free speech, than we are in actually working with those where we can work to change and take care of this threat before it becomes even more pernicious than it already is. I know that there is a fair amount of agreement um, on the panel, but I think that the audience can perhaps help us in picking out some of the distinctions between our speakers, specifically looking at where and if we do draw lines um, of free speech on campus, and whether we think there's been a lot of talk about feminism and feminists and feminist societies. I'm not so sure that it's only coming from them, so I'd love to hear what you think. I think a lot of this comes from the whole current fetishization of victimhood, which is much wider um, I mean, if you look at the way in which discussion around rape and sex crime and child abuse and historic abuse claims, which are very prevalent in the UK at the moment, uh, and, and which have been highly politicised because um, members of various political parties have been taking up the cause of these um, victims or people who say they are victims. Um, and it has become absolutely corrosive. I mean, you are not allowed to, to have a sensible discussion about, say, due process in the courts. I mean, forget about campuses. <laughs> Within the courts, and if you appear against a victim advocate on television to talk about this, you just simply get this Stepford wife clone babbling on about how victims are re-traumatised by the justice process and how this is intolerable and how it all must be changed. And anyone who argues with this is, is, is treated as a pariah. And I'm, I'm a practising lawyer. I've, I've been on the receiving end of this. And it's quite astonishing the extent to which mainstream media will then just collude with this and not even have a sensible discussion because they are so frightened of having a sensible discussion. And it's ironic that it's actually left to the sort of the Daily Mail columnists um, to actually argue this, because nobody else actually wants to weigh in, and they're backed by a very powerful media group, so they can say what they like, and they are effectively, if you like, the Katie Hopkins <laughs> of the media world. Um, and I think it's really dispiriting, and I'm very pleased that we're having this discussion, because I think that the more people fight back uh, across a wide front, um, the more we're going to have a much more sane and sensible discussion and help the real victims and not the ones who are the pseudo-victims. Thank you. I, I'm trying to square two sides of this, and one is... Uh, if I talk to normal people who don't exist on university campuses, I explain this stuff to them and they can't believe it and they've never heard of it. So if I said trigger warning to somebody who works in a normal profession like architecture, they have never heard of that term. And I sort of explain these scenarios to people and they say, what the hell is going on here? But on the other hand, I just wonder where, where the trans issue sits on this because I think what's really, really weird about the trans issue is just how mainstream it's become really, really fast. So a couple of weeks ago, um, the Daily Mirror had a story on the front page about uh, a, a family of uh, had a twin a boy and a girl and one of the twins had changed uh, sex or was heading towards changing sex but had certainly changed gender identity. And this was written in an entirely affirmative way. And even on the Daily Mail, if you, when they cover these stories, the comments are often very, very affirmative of this process. And I just wondered how, I just don't understand the trans issue. So maybe given that you've delved into it for a year, uh, if you can explain it to me, oh what it gosh. represents in this context. All right. And it's being filmed and it's gonna go online. <laughs> and I'm gonna get you can like say whatever you like here. We want shit. you to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great contributions from the panel. Really appreciated it. Uh, I agreed with an awful lot of what was said there, and I particularly agree about the ascendancy of identity politics. So perhaps being a bit mean, just pick up on two things that I didn't quite agree with. Um, I'm not convinced that the left-right political framework is a particularly useful lens for understanding what's going on here. Um, I'm also not convinced that students are directly taught these ideas once they arrive at university, um, although I do think lecturers are largely responsible for having put these ideas ideas out into society and they certainly don't do anything whatsoever to challenge those ideas when once students arrive with them. 
I think what's key is very much what the woman at the front was talking about, uh, this perception of vulnerability that students arrive at university with already having. And I think it would be really um, interesting to try and tease out why it is that students are arriving at university perceiving of themselves already as being so vulnerable. I don't think there's necessarily an easy answer to that. I think it kind of encompasses parenting and a lot of other trends that are going on in society. But the thing that, that worries me, and, and I'm kind of directing this to Christine, you know, because students seem to really, in my experience, really genuinely believe that they are vulnerable to a whole host of things, kind of coming at them with the statistics, and I think the first debate that we had this morning about rape culture really showed this, kind of coming at them with the statistics and saying, look, your chances of being raped on campus are absolutely minimal. It is not going to happen. It just doesn't seem to have any impact whatsoever. It's like, well, I don't care what the statistics are anymore. It makes no difference. I am still scared. And I think until we really take up and try and understand what's causing this underlying vulnerability, perception of vulnerability, you know, we're, we're, only, we're never going to go far in really tackling this kind of current climate of censorship. But I used to support political correctness. Uh, had I known that it was going to give them birth to this safe spaces culture, I don't think I would have. Does anyone on the panel have similar regrets? <laughs> Thanks. I'll answer the question about why I think the trans uh, people are the ideal object of sympathy for these politics. And I think they are cast as objects, not subjects. This process is as insulting to them as it is to the rest of us. Uh, and I think it's mainly because they have little or no connection uh, to historical developments or to large constituencies of people, which would present an impediment and an inconvenience to the sort of dynamics of identity politics. So trans people are the ideal object of sympathy for the free play uh, of these ideas. Um, the, other, the other couple of things I wanted to say very quickly, the, as well as being a free speech casualty here, there's a human casualty. I mean, Christina's alluded to it. I've lost friends uh, who have become... Then it's not an affectation. They, they genuinely feel unsafe. They genuinely feel frightened. They genuinely think the world is frightening. They've lost their grip on reality. That's absolutely tragic. Um, I see it happening to young people. I see universities where uh, there's a only, you know, a minimum of three people in a dorm room because fewer than that might, risk, might be a risk. And this perpetuates mistrust of others, mistrust of oneself. We get now self-flagellating people. This poor woman in Oxford who breached some consent code and has gone around saying, may I help her? Uh, it's absolutely, it, it's tragic. And the, the very last thing, um, I would caution against treating this as a cult. I agree it has many similarities, but in terms of sort of responding to it with, with uh, uh, measures that are sort of in any way coercive or, or in themselves spread fear, uh, you know, that could be a problem. We don't want to end up with a sort of enfeebled French state-enforced secularism, because that's a problem as well. Thanks very much. Some of you may have read an analysis by the NYU psychologist Jonathan Haidt, who noted that we may be moving... There was a time in 18th and 19th century when, in the West, we moved from honor culture to a culture of dignity. And in an honor culture, people are easily wounded and, and offended, and, but it's, uh, it, it rests upon them to avenge themselves, so you get duels and all sorts of you know, inter, you know, feuds and interpersonal. There's no authority involved, but you have to right these wrongs. You're sensitive to the wrongs, and you have to right them. We moved to uh, what I think was an improvement, a, a dignity culture, which was more in, in individuals, uh, and you, you, you would have your differences if someone... If someone insulted you or wounded you, that you didn't turn to an authority. But if you were seriously harmed, you didn't engage in a duel. You turned to, then you would turn to the police or the state or the, the college authorities. But it was it was rare. It wasn't the norm. He said, now we have a victim culture, where you have, and it sort of takes the worst from both. From the uh, from the honor culture, they're easily offended. They're chronically offended, and there's even. Um, a prestige in being a victim. And we find on campuses, I find that a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is most acute at the more elite the campus. The greater the victimization, the higher the tuition. And their parents are paying. I mean, there can't be anything more elite than Swarthmore or, or Oberlin or Wesleyan or Yale, but there they are at Oxford. Uh, so they take the worst from the, from the honor culture, being easily offended, but they want to turn to the authority from the uh, culture of dignity, 
so they're constantly turning to authorities, whereas it's rare in a culture of dignity. It's, they, they're obsessed with authorities. They're obsessed. I, I mean, when I went to college, the last thing, we didn't want the deans in our lives. <laughs> and they were, no one thought of, we threw them out. We threw them out of the dorms. They, we had parietal hours and all, that was all gone. It's all coming back. They're obsessed with authority and a victim identity and the prestige of, of they're almost competitions for victimization. So we've, we have this challenge to find our way, I think, back to what I think is preferred in, in a much more balanced society of an individual and private agency and where it's rare, where you, where you work out differences and you don't take offense. You're not chronically offended and diminished. But now how to do that, I don't, I don't know. OK, <laughs> maybe we'll figure out in. <laughs> Um, I mean, to go back on the, the left, right thing, Joanna. I mean, so I, I do think that this is more of a thing on the left than it is the right. I mean, there are some signs of it on the right. So, I mean, you see it from UKIP people. I mean, the kippers online are a bunch of lunatics. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll come for you or anything. And they definitely have that sense of purity and of imagined victimhood. So I, I take that that's there. But overwhelmingly, you see this more on the left than you do on the right. I think part of that, by the way, is wrapped up in the victimhood thing, actually, that the left always had this thing of priding itself on looking after the victims of the world. And so actually, you get yourself into this arms race of victimhood, of you know, in the intersectionality and all of that. So I, I do think that there seems to be more of it there. And also the identity politics splits that took place that overwhelmingly on the left. So I think mostly the right just cruises along running the country. And, you know, and then the left just you know, gets on with its own mad, harebrained business. So, I, so I, do, I think it's quite hard to look at it without shopping that out there. But this is not, I, I take the point that this is not, at the end of the day, a left-right thing, and that's all that it's about. All right, great, thanks. Yeah. Um, on the victim thing, I blame Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> I, 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 I remember in, in the kind of early 90s, noticing that people were um, talking about all these terrible things that happened to them as a child in a way that never happened before. And it was, there was, you know, I grew up in America and there was a real um, push for these stories on these, these chat shows and TV programs. And it's kind of like that, um, I noticed it in the UK around when Princess Diana died. There was this kind of, oh, it's so, you know, so terrible, I'm so upset. And there's just been this, this gradual change as far as that's concerned. Um, one thing uh, I'll say, you said you were a lawyer when, when you were talking about the victim thing. Um, uh, my house was burgled and um, I um, caught the burglar, I punched him. Um, and, and then he was caught and he, he went to jail. And I got a phone call from victim support. And they said, oh, hello. <laughs> oh, you must be feeling bad. And I said, no, I'm, f I'm fine. I punched him. <laughs> and it's like, I'm not a victim. And then that was it. But there was definitely a, a push from them to try and make me say, oh, yes, it's really terrible. I'm not like that. I wasn't raised like that. Right. <laughs> Tom? Um, so to pick up some of the questions, that I think in terms of where this has come from, um, you you can kind of split up into these kind of social issues and these more ardently political ones. So on the social side, I think there's this constant promotion, not only that we're all victims, but we're all ultimately vulnerable. And you see this in all different um, sections of society. You know, there's anything to do with, like, from the stranger danger panic to the kind of self-esteem obsession, which seemed to crop up in the last 10 years or so. Um, it's particularly with children. You know, you can't say anything that might upset them has kind of really undermined this idea of resilience. But I also think in terms of the campus context in particular, um, it's quite interesting that I meet a lot of students who are really in favour of freedom of speech, but when it comes to the claims about rape culture, when it comes to the claims about um, women being uniquely vulnerable, they buy into that completely. And I think what that speaks to is a willingness to believe that people are genuinely kind of at risk at all times. Because if you really look into those statistics, as Christina has debunked them so thoroughly, um, the, the chances of them actually being attacked, particularly on a university campus, are incredibly slim. Um, so I think ultimately it's this idea of constantly being at peril, constantly being at threat. The idea that people, in this case young men in particular, are incredibly volatile, fuels this kind of climate in which people are willing to try and control speech and, and thought. But at the same time, I think on, on the campus political level, I think it's bang on that identity <laughs> politics plays a huge role in this. And the reason for that is I disagree with Ian on the point of free speech just being about self-interest. I think there's also a kind of universalist... Um, kind of uh, impulse within that, the idea that we can um, all come 
to agreement, the idea that we can all agree on something. And I think the problem with identity politics from, you know, 70s feminism and the personal is political onwards is that it's suggested that our ideas are determined by um, our, our biology or our race. Um, and at the same time, it suggests that um, we're particularly um, vulnerable because of that. And I think that ultimately anti-universalist impulse is really what's at the heart of that because it suggests that we can't agree on anything because you're biologically hardwired to be oppressed and to see the world in a certain way. And at the same time, it preaches vulnerability. It valorizes victimhood. And I think that's the problem underlying this. Just very quickly to pick up on, on Ian's point about how do we take this back and whether, whether libertarians are being a bit too um, kind of catty about it and not letting <laughs> there be any space to debate. I think fundamentally, we, we can all, from people across you know, the political spectrum, if you want to call it that, can come together to challenge this. But we have to agree on one thing, and that has to be that free speech is indivisible. Otherwise, there's no point. You're already making concessions. It will already spread. And I certainly don't see people sticking up for that at the moment. I mean, when the free speech movement in America first kicked off, it's very much remembered as a kind of early new left. They were all civil rights activists and all the rest of it. But at Berkeley, there were um, some of the people intimately involved with that, with that whole um, stream of protest were supporters of, um, they were, there was a Students for Goldwater group, Barry Goldwater, who was a senator who was actually against um, the Civil Rights Act. So there was, they all recognised that if you were going to um, be able to have these discussions, you had to start from a position of believing in free speech for all. At the moment, I don't see that, and I think that's the problem. Oh, can I just add one thing? Just Sorry, one thing yeah, very briefly. Briefly. I just want to agree with Ian, too, and something I forgot to mention is that... Uh, We've seen in the, there's been a big battle over video games, and there's been a very interesting phenomenon of, um, and, and Alan Bakari has written about this in Breitbart. He's the house, the sort of the token liberal at Breitbart. But he, uh, he has said there are, it's really not right and left, as you say, and that it's becoming more cultural authoritarians and cultural libertarians. And the authoritarians are, take something like video games and wanting to censor them and having a panic about what's ruining the children and more, and more you find conservatives saying that and, and the left come together. But there has grown now a movement called Gamergate, which is the left has come together with the right, and they are fighting the, the cultural authoritarians. So I find that a very interesting alliance. And we have it in a group called Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's a liberal and a conservative started it, and it's brought free people that are united around free speech. That's the way to go. Great. Very much. Thanks. On this left-right issue, I think one of the key issues in politics today is how you understand the world. And fundamentally, you can either understand it by using uh, your brain, or you can understand it by using your heart. And, you know, it's a case of reason versus emotion. And obviously, if you believe in reason and using your brain, then you believe very firmly in free speech. Someone will say something... Um, I'll listen to it, I may not agree with it, I'll think about it, and then I say, well, that's very interesting, but I don't agree with you, these are my reasons why. Um, now, that, 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 that's, a, that's one side of the equation. Now, a lot of people have actually given up on that whole means of understanding the world. What they tend to do now is say, I, I, I feel that's wrong. You've said something, it's hurt me. You know, people have an emotional response. I mean, you can see this very clearly in the immigration debate. I mean, you see it in something like gay marriage as well, where a lot of people say, if you don't let me marry, I'll be deeply offended. Um, you know, it's actually very prevalent in, in so much social policy. But the thing is, if, if that's the way you understand the world, then clearly free speech has no place to play, because what matters is not your understanding, it's simply your feeling and the emotional response that you have. Now, just on the left-right thing, it does seem to me that the left has very much gone down this road of, uh, of understanding the world through their feelings. Whereas the right sometimes do, but on the whole, they, they, they tend to stick with the idea of trying to understand the world by thinking about it. So actually, Ian, this might be the first and last time it happens, but I'm reasonably sympathetic to your position on this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say, I agree with basically everything that's been said, but was anyone from the sort of Tumblr fe feminist world actually invited to be here? Because we've kind of got our own echo chamber here, so... Thanks. I'd just like to bring up the question of authority, because I think what's interesting about this kind of authoritarianism that we're talking about is it's emerging at a period where there isn't actually any sort of authority. So the universities 
do not assert their own authority in these situations when there are these calls for bans. They do things like, you know, make it into a health and safety issue. They retreat from actually staking, making a, a statement um, which, you know, states their own authority. I think, again, what we see in the, in, in the, the, the lawyer, you know, bringing up the question about these sort of um, uh, historic abuse cases and the way that these things seem to roll out of control is because the police and the, the legal system either kind of step back and let, say, a journalist or something pursue a, um, a particular hobby horse, or even worse, you sometimes see the authorities, the institutions and the establishment actually manipulating and exploiting the, the, the kind of um, the, the, the instability that this gives rise to in order to sort of conduct little infights and battles going on. And that kind of reminds me of the things that went on, say, in the Cultural Revolution in China, where the authorities were in retreat in a way, but they actually tried to use the kind of chaos and instability that stirred up by little forces of people, kind of micro-arguments that were breaking out all over the place. So I'm really interested in this kind of authoritarianism that is arising at a time when authority and institutional authority is either in disarray or in retreat. And it's a vacuum now Very opened good. up, free for all. As a student myself, I'd like to disagree with most of what's been said so far. <laughs> um, Great, we needed it. I, I don't deny that there is uh, a problem with uh, freedom of speech on campus, but I do deny that it comes from the students. There was an incident at my own university very recently, I think it was the beginning of last year, where a group of students tried to wear sombreros on a fancy dress night out and sombreros, this was viewed as a racist stereotype and sombreros were subsequently banned. Uh, every human being I've spoken to on that campus since then agreed that that was a stupid thing to do. And on that basis, I'd, I'd really contest the idea that students as a whole, or even the majority of students, it may be different in America, I'm interested in the idea that 30 students ran off to, and a dog ran off to a safe space. <laughs> but um, I'm that very... That was Oberlin, that may be a <laughs> very okay. precious place. So. But I do dispute the idea that even the majority of students would share this uh, repressive idea to freedom of speech. As another slightly different example, um, now going to Oxford, uh, a debate was going to be held there about abortion, and uh, one uh, anti-abortion journalist turned up. Uh, the debate was actually cancelled. Um, the journalist interpreted this as because he had turned up and there'd been, there had been protests in being there, but not, uh, the debate wasn't cancelled as a result of those protests. It was because um, last minute ad administ administrative changes. I actually have a friend who was managing the debate at the time. Uh, so it can, I feel it can be the case that this is entirely misrepresented and that the majority of students don't feel any of this freedom of speech repression at all. Thank you. Tom, I basically have a question for you. You've uh, reiterated on a number of occasions from the platform that you're in favour of absolute free speech. And I would say that I am too, but um, it does have consequences. I mean, to give you two areas that are not necessarily relevant to this debate, but it is relevant to the debate on free speech. And number one is if you're in absolute favour of free speech, then you would favour uh, slander or in all defamation, and you'd also be in favour of blackmail. So the question then comes down to is, are you drawing the line somewhere? Like you'll say that blackmail and, and defamation aren't restricted and you would restrict them in some way. So you're really drawing the line somewhere and you're not really in favour of, of absolute free speech. Or would you yourself turn around and say no... Uh, Blackmail and defamation are perfectly acceptable you know, within society, or at least look, not to subject to any sort of uh, restrictions. Um, so that's really the main question I have. But I have one further point that I would like to, uh, you know, uh, you know, I would like to make, and that's uh, relevant to where the restrictions on free speech are. And I think uh, Christina Hoff, uh, sorry, Christina said uh, in an earlier debate that uh, she, her side of the argument on free speech won the won the war, if you like, but lost all the, the associate professorships to the other side of the debate that are anti-free speech. And in my experience, um, what's going on is not necessarily students. Students are being led in certain campuses by uh, university lecturers and professors <coughs> who are encouraging this. I mean, so for example, um, 
where I did a master's in philosophy, say Birkbeck College in London, you know, you get courses in Department of Philosophy or Speech, Free Speech and Power. And all of these, spe all of these talks are designed to restrict and encourage restriction on free speech. First of all, I have a huge problem with defamation. I think ultimately um, that's not something that would look to restrict at all. It's, it's a free speech issue no different from anything else. My problem is that when people say beyond that, where don't you draw the line somewhere, they bring up things like blackmail. They bring up things which to me are effectively crimes that involve speech. It's not speech purely, in the same way that lying on your tax return involves speech. I think we can make a clear distinction between um, speech and expression on one side and something which is actually just um, implicit in, in a criminal act. I was really interested in the point about, about authority and universities kind of not asserting it, because one thing that's really interesting is that um, the university's inability to stand up for these values, which really are at the core of their whole kind of moral mission, effectively. And what happens is there's a lot of institutional... You've got this horrible kind of marriage between institutional cowardice and these small groups of intolerant protesters. Um, they're just so willing to cave in for the sake of losing a bit of PR. But what's, what's happening is, because of that refusal to stick up for it, you have these groups, these student groups, who are effectively able to kind of redefine the purpose of a university on their own terms. I mean, you see this a lot, particularly around the kind of... Um, issues around sexual consent and University of um, Oxford made it mandatory for all sports teams, Cambridge made it mandatory for all first years and they talk about how the purpose of a university is to encourage inclusive values and all these sorts of things. So you're effectively uh, refashioning university as not a place in which you can test ideas and you try ideas, it's a place in which you can inculcate people into certain ideas and beliefs and I think that's happened because the universities are failing to kind of stick up for themselves. Um, on the point that the gentleman raised about it not being all students, I completely agree with you. I, I think it's, it's small groups of campaigners, it's particularly student unions, who, as it goes, are amongst the most un undemocratic institutions <laughs> in the country. I think if you made um, NUS membership something you had to go and sign up to, rather than um, just given to you automatically, the National Union of Students would collapse pretty much overnight. So um, I think we do need to make that distinction. I think the problem is that because um, there's so little fight back against this, or the fight back is so um, piecemeal and a little bit chaotic, universities not sticking up for it, other people making concessions, then those people start to define the whole student movement, as it were, if we can even call it that anymore. So it's certainly not all students, but I think the rest of them really need to start fighting back so that we don't have that conception. just wanted to follow on with that, because um, I don't think by any means it's all students at all. One of the issues on campus, as I understand it, is that if students form a group, they have to belong to the NUS in order to secure funding for their group. And so they have to abide by the NUS's rules. This is what happened with, I think they're the Secular and Free Speech Society at Manchester who invited um, Julie Bindle, and, and that was just um, cut down. They, they basically said, we have to follow the rules of the NUS because that is how we get funding. So as, as far as that situation is concerned, what I think is that the university needs to, to step in. There is um, a bit of legislation. There's not been any court cases, so, so it's, it's not been upheld. I've, I've copied it out here. It's the Education Act 1986. Um, it's freedom of speech in universities, polytechnics, and colleges, so that tells you how old this is. It says, every individual and body of persons connected with the university must take steps to ensure that freedom of speech is secured for members, students, and employees of the establishment and for visiting speakers. They have the duty to ensure that the use of any premises of the establishment is not denied to any individual or body of persons on any ground connected with the beliefs or views of that individual or of any member of that body. So there is legislation out there that says universities have a duty of care to uphold freedom of speech for visiting speakers and people on campus. This has not been challenged. There hasn't been any, any case law at all. So no one's kind of following it. Um, there, I think there needs to be some case law. I, I, I would like this to happen with the University of Manchester thing, with Julie Bindle being cancelled, my own <laughs> personal opinion. I also think that um, uh, universities in the UK, there is a university in the States, the University of Chicago came out with a manifesto upholding freedom of speech on campus for, for all students and free, um, academic freedom. I think universities in the UK, lecturers and, and, and staff don't really know what's going on with the students. Um, they, they really do need to be made aware and universities need to come out with, with uh, manifestos upholding freedom of speech because pretty soon it's going to start affecting academic freedom. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I mean, I take your point on the echo chamber thing, actually, but Tom and I are trying to have a disagreement, but no one will take us up on it. <laughs> um, but I mean, there is, the distinction isn't ideas. I mean, I think 
kind of everyone on the panel is on the same thing there. But there is a distinction in tactics and how we go on from here. And actually, to pick up on your point of where is the limit on, on um, you know, blackmail, for instance, I mean, I'll preface this you know, as a sort of declaration of interest. Like, I'm friends with Caroline, who I'm about to mention. I'm also friends with people on Spike, who, who I'm also mentioning. So take it all as you wish. But I mean, you know, when Caroline Crowder Perez pulls out of a feminist conference on free speech matters, Spike sends out a tweet going, she's not really into free speech because she... She, she was behind police charges on someone. You know, this is someone who, these are people who are text tweeting, going, I'm outside your home, I'm gonna murder you now. Now, like, if there's a limit to free speech, it's telling someone you're gonna butcher them, okay? So that, that's where that limit is. And if we as libertarians say, or free speech campaigners, or whatever we wanna call it, if we're gonna say, well, what it really means is that anyone can send you anonymous things, I mean, no one can put up with that level of attack and abuse and fear for their personal security. That is a free speech issue, but it's a free speech issue against her. So if we take on this absolutist streak, this purity politics persona that we have seen from identity politics that we have seen in the debates in campus, and we as free speech campaigners apply it, we lose any of the sympathy that we might get from anti-racist campaigners, from feminists, from trans activists. We lose the ability to talk to them and to be part of the debate. And I think that the sort of the slightly sterile nature that we can get in free speech campaigns, where it turns into an echo chamber, comes because we're unwilling to have that debate with the, the sort of centers of where that ferocious battle is taking place. Um, I just want to take up the question um, a student posed, and, and uh, uh, saying it's not the students, and then we blame the, the, it's the professors, do we blame the administration? I uh, believe that things got very bad in the United States within the last two years, and it's possible that the intensity came from the United States to Great Britain, I'm not sure. But what happened a few years ago is that um, the, these women's groups, there have always been, say, there have been, the identity politics has been raging in the universities for a long time, and you've had people that use the phrase rape culture and so forth, but it was contained largely in women's centers and gender studies. Suddenly it's everywhere. How did, the, you know, it's in the media and everyone's in, in a dither. Had this happen? Well, uh, I actually watched it. It, with horror, <laughs> as it, it it happened, I noticed that uh, National Public Radio, which is very respected, even by me, I like uh, much of what they do, but uh, they did a, a, a very alarming story about um, an epidemic of campus assault. And they actually went, uh, this was soon, uh, uh, this was a, a new assistant secretary for civil rights in our Department of Education, and a reporter from NPR went directly to Assistant Secretary Ruslan Ali and said, what are you going to do about this? The Department of Education is allowing this, all of this campus assault to, to flourish and, and, and rage on and you're not doing anything. And she promised action to NPR. She then sends out a letter called a Dear Colleague Letter. And without going into any details, it, it, universities are afraid of this letter because, she, and in this letter she said, she sort of read campus as the riot act. She said, you have to provide a safe space for women. You have to stop this epidemic of, of assault. There wasn't an epidemic, but she believed it. NPR had told her. I don't know who told NPR, feminist activists. And then she included speech. She included everything. Suddenly, the campuses had to make it a safe place for women. And, and if they didn't, this woman came from the Department of Education, and she enforces this, the civil rights on the campus they could have taken away the funding. So suddenly you have deans and college presidents, if they don't basically do the bidding of the most uh, kind of uh, paranoid people on the campus, even among feminists, you get these, uh, these safe space, trigger warning, you know, uh, call out feminists, maybe the Tumblr feminists, and they're calling the shots because they are holding the university hostage. It's not a stable situation because no one is happy. We're, it's led to these kangaroo courts, so the, the schools are getting sued and they're beginning to lose in court. Uh, the, 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 the administrators aren't all that happy about it and they're angry at the Department of Education. Department of Education, they're starting to have congressional hearings. It's gonna take a long time to sort it out, but I do take it all back to the, this strange radical politics on the campus being given by the media legitimacy, in, in this case NPR, but also the New York Times, it was given legitimacy, this, this reckless 
scholarship, and then they, they moved to the government. So that's how it moved, and now the schools are in a panic about it. Okay, I just want to pop in and very, say, very say as well that in, in the states and universities, professors are new, now losing their jobs because of this, this attitude with the students. This came that from this letter. That hasn't come here yet. Um, and, and professors in the UK and lecturers in the UK are not issuing trigger warnings. That hasn't happened in the UK yet. That has happened in the States. But it, we're a few years behind in okay. the UK. On this point about being able to express your opinion about, uh, about these matters, I think what really happens is that people, a sort of cultural mindset has set in whereby if you say one thing, you are heard as saying something else. So if you say, if Christina Hoff Summers turns up at Oberlin and says, there isn't a rape culture, she is heard as saying, uh, she's, she thinks rape doesn't matter, or she thinks that it's all being exaggerated. What a terrible thing. And I don't know whether this is a sort of intellectual or an emotional problem that people have with this, because intellectually it's obviously rubbish. I mean, people might be saying all, to, all sorts of things that don't have certain implications, even though they're very easily thought to have those implications. And the obvious reply is to say, well, actually, it doesn't have those implications. But if you work yourself in, up into an emotional state whereby you want to be one of the right crowd, you want to be those who really see and detect evil and do something about it, you're not going to be concerned about truth or reason or argument. And that's really the moral rot of this whole business. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to offer a, a defence of Battle of Ideas and, and this panel in particular of the, uh, the accusations of it being uh, uh, you know, an echo chamber. I think it's been an on-running theme having been here for, for both days. And if anybody's ever tried to have conversations with these censorious kinds of people, the, the, the identity politics people, You'll know, and I, I was in this position last year, desperately trying to talk to people about an issue, and it was the, the exact same response every time. It was always, try and question anything about their narrative, and it was, no, you're a misogynist, no, you're a shitlord, no, you're the scum of the earth. <laughs> so I think, I, think it's in, I think it's entirely understandable that we end up with panels that reach a consensus before the panel has even begun, because no one's willing to enter the debate on the other side. Quick things. I just wondered, to what extent has the mainstreaming of feminism... Um, now is now calling the shots because I didn't quite agree with you, Ian, that there's a left-right thing here. I, I filmed the Wise Awards, 500 captains of industry literally running around seeing how they could develop anti-bullying, you know, censorious politics in the workplace and set up <coughs> women's networks for women that didn't want to go to them. And very quickly on the point made by Jan McVarish at the front, that outside the world of <coughs> campuses, this isn't familiar. I think that's true. I talk to a lot of young people pre-university. They haven't heard of this stuff, but they'll tell you they can't get on the tube in London because of rape culture. And digging a bit deeper, I find out there's at least the first six schools, that's probably all schools, have got an anti-hugging policy because girls are at risk of 11-year-old boys holding their hands and these girls not realising what's a sexual advance and what isn't. That's frightening. Uh, just Obviously, a lot of this conversation being about the elite chattering classes, the people in authority. Um, I used to work on building sites. I don't really recognise this. How much of... If it is just about a conversation happening within the elite classes, how much impact do you think it's having on the wider society? Uh, just to pick up on something that Christina said at the beginning, um, when she went to Swarthmore or wherever it was, and you saw activists with their mouths taped shut, the reason they do that now is the argument is now that by turning up, you are depriving them of their free speech. So this whole event is actually a campaign against their free speech. Now, oh. <laughs> so before, where you can actually engage with an argument, no platform, safe space, etc., now the argument is so vacuous that it's actually impossible to argue with, because by turning up and asking them their opinion and offering your responses you are campaigning against their free speech or denying their free speech. So it's a difficult one oh my to goodness. argue with. I don't think the problem is the media. I think it's the problem of the state acting on what the media says, because there are all sorts of claims made on the state. And just to show you how this works, in my child's uh, middle school, uh, for the last two years, and probably longer, they have little signs outside the classrooms that say, this is a safe space. Um, we have four therapists. We have no full-time librarian. And the reason why we don't have that is that the, the school it, district is uh, obliged to pay for all of this therapy. Um, and so there's definitely you know, a, a prioritization that has taken on a life of its own that you know, people don't really have control over. Just to 
put something to you. I think that we have found that people do have lines and freedom of speech, and there is a bit of a disagreement on the panel. So I mean, on the challenge of talking to free speech a lot, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, you know what's amazing is when you write these features on these guys, on the student union guys, when they turn off, they won't speak to you. you, you over three days, you'll try and you'll try and you'll try and they will not speak to you. And then you publish and then suddenly they come at you on Twitter. And it's this sort of, you know, saying, well, I would demand a retraction. And, blah, blah, blah. Well, you've had literally like 64 hours to give me a statement on the issue. And actually, I think that comes from the sense of victimhood. To preserve it, you need to not be asked many questions by the media because that makes it illegitimate. However, let's not get into the position where we start thinking that's all the identity politics people, or that's where all of the debate is happening. Those are where the anti-free speech people are. And there are very many people within feminism, within these other movements, who are pro-free speech, who want to work if they do not see that what is coming is an anti-feminist or an anti-anti-racism agenda, as long as they show that we're willing to work with them. Thank you very much. OK. Christina. Um, there are things about this that are new. Supposedly, there's nothing new under the sun, but I don't remember. I, I can't find antecedents in history where people, I mean, the reason they didn't, they don't want people like us to speak on the campus is because we give them PTSD. You know, that's just very different. But uh, I will say that uh, freedom, uh, it's not an abstraction. It's real. It affects our happiness, our ability to lead a meaningful life, a productive life. It can't be taken for granted. I think every generation has to learn it, and, and in some ways they have to earn it, they have to fight for it. So um, there's always a temptation to trade freedoms for some promised benefits. They're almost, now those are abs abstractions and usually turn out to be fantasies. Freedom is real, these promises are abstractions. So I think today is probably the millennial generation. Uh, you're going to have to decide, and it's, uh, you know, is, is this going to be a generation that stands helplessly by? and you know, even applauds when basic freedoms are stripped away. Uh, the gender politics on the campus have already led, at least on our elite campuses, I, I can't say that it's all campuses, uh, but uh, on the elite campuses, we already have censorship, vigilantism, mob rule, uh, the victim, victim industrial complex, as some have called it, it's tightening its grip. So my best guess is that the millennials, like generations before them, are going to rally, they are going to defend their democratic freedoms. And um, this conference has already filled me with hope. <laughs> so, um, I, because I, I see signs of resistance, and I just hope the resistance movement forms quickly. Thank you very much, Gia. Um, I just wanted to talk about, um, you, you, you were talking about trying to discuss these topics with the, the people who, you know, are in favor of no platform. Um, I produced a, this tan panel discussion at Conway Hall. Um, I'd asked Brendan O'Neill and Julie Bindle to be on um, the panel and was trying to find someone, anyone. I, I was literally, it was six months I was trying to find someone from the NUS. I started at the president, went all the way down to like, you know, assistant, whatever. They, they wouldn't, they either said no or they wouldn't reply to me. I was um, contacting everyone. I mean, even just idiots on Twitter. I was just saying, <laughs> will, you, will you come and defend this? And they absolutely wouldn't because they wouldn't share a platform with Julie Bindle. Julie pulled out for reasons, for other reasons, um, and I approached other people, and I finally got, as you mentioned, um, Bahar Mustafa to agree to come on to the panel. Um, you can see this on, on YouTube. It's, it's, a, it's a great discussion. I think Brendan did fabulously well on it. But it's incredibly difficult. Bahar didn't really say anything either in the, in the whole, whole discussion. <laughs> I, I don't really know what her position is other than um, she, she equates uh, physical safety with intellectual safety. They're the same thing to her. So she feels physically threatened by <coughs> you know, challenges <coughs> to her ideas. I, I, I don't know. OK, thanks. <coughs> Tom. Um, so the point on, first of all, on the mainstreaming of feminism, I think actually taps into a lot of this. Because I think the, the way in which feminism has been mainstreamed, it's not that a kind of clear set of beliefs or aims have suddenly been taken up by the masses. What's happened is you've got this very diluted form of feminism, so broad that anyone from, you know, Beyonce to Julie Bindel was suddenly in the same category. <laughs> um, and I think what that means, what's happened there is that feminism has kind of just wrapped itself around this general kind of sense 
of vulnerability of, and ultimately of, of victimhood. Oh, if you want to be a feminist nowadays, it's very easy, but you just have to admit as a woman that you're a victim. I think that just speaks to the way in which this is a broader cultural problem about a perceived sense of vulnerability that really fuels all of this. And in terms of the effect it will have on wider society, I think the, the thing that we have to realise is that so many people are going to university nowadays. And of course, there's always the fact that, um, as the gentleman pointed out up there, it's a small sliver of students who engage in student politics, let alone this kind of student politics. The, f the mission creep of it, you know, it used to just be about um, banning fascists, now it's about banning feminists. And now really it's gone down to the regulation of behaviour, you know, trying to um, uh, sexual harassment policies that ban catcalling and um, basically any, any sort of misplaced chat-up line could get you ejected from the university campus, even to the kind of regulation of social life, you know, rug rugby teams. Um, essentially getting banned for being rugby teams is um, really quite strange. And I think all what the issue that we've really got to get to grips with here is that censorship in the past used to be kind of partisan and political. At least that's how it was originally conceived. No platform was about stopping the fascists and et cetera, et cetera. I think the way in which it has spread is that we've almost got beyond that. We've almost got into a position, because all of these kinds of trends have really suffused, that um, ultimately debate full stop is seen as dangerous. And I think that's really the problem we have. And that's why I think we need to all unite under a banner of freedom of speech for all, because we need to start having debates about things again. We really need to. But if we're enabled to do it, we can't just um, say that we're all happy, clappy, and suddenly we're all friends again, just because each of us have friends who have been banned. That's really not good enough. Um, we all have to stick up for free speech, not only for our friends, but for also the people we hate. That's the only place in which we're actually going to be able to get to a position where we can talk about these things again, we can push the conversation forward. Thank you.